Hey, hi everyone, this is Phil from statisticsmentor.com and today we're going to be looking at the residual plot. Now once you've run a regression, a standard regression model, so your DV is continuous, then we can use the residual plot to see whether any of the conditions of your classical regression models are not satisfied. For this I'm going to be looking at education data where my DV is earnings and my IV is years of schooling. Let's recap on what this residual plot is. Now say I've got a scatter plot here of my IV, let's call it X and my DV. So in this case DV is earnings, X is years of schooling and I might have some data points like this loads of them okay and the idea of fitting the model is to find the line of best fit it might look something like this if I can draw it right now what the residual plot is is a plot of the residuals so what is the residuals in layman's terms the residual is the mistake that your line makes in predicting the value of y example Say that I want the value of the predicted value of y when x is this amount, because remember this is just a series of num list of numbers. So I would read off the graph like this and go up there. However, so the predicted value would be whatever this value is here. However, the true value for that value of x is not that, but this. So we've made a mistake, and that difference between the dot and the line is the residual. Okay, so if we have to write that down, the residual for a point, for a particular point, is equal to the observed value of that point minus the predicted value from the from your model. In notational terms, it's y i, where i denotes i for observation, minus predicted value. We use hat to denote the different the uh, predicted value. Okay, so that is a difference between observed and what your model thinks it is. So that's if it's bigger than zero, if it's not zero, then that's that's a, a mistake. So it's called right. The residual then. So residual goes up on the vertical axis, and along this horizontal axis, you can see variously that some people use the IV, the explanatory variable, or they might use the let's use the word or predicted value of y, standardized or unstandardized. Now let us use for x, so I can kind of compare these two pictures and show you how I build up the residual plot. For this particular point here, I can see that the residual, the, the error here, is positive. Let me do that in a different color. Okay, that that is a positive residual. Why? Because residual is observed value. That's observed value right here, the dot there, minus the predicted value predicted value is lower so the residual is positive so we go map this below that's the same value of x and the residual is positive so it might be something there this residual this time it's negative so we go the same axis at negative that one that's positive one but it's a slightly smaller one and so on and so you can see that I can build up a whole picture of many many dots I can build up a residual plot now Let's think about let's think about an extreme picture of the residual plot. Suppose I have a perfect fit. What do I mean by perfect fit? I mean that I managed to find a line that goes through all the points. We'll say I've got three points. Easily you can see that the line goes through all the points. What my what would my residual plot look like? Residual at this point. Well, the observed matches the predicted, so that's zero, zero, scale of zero. That's negative, that's positive. There, that's also zero. There, that residual is also zero. In other words, when we have a perfect fit, when the line goes through all the points, your residual plot is going to look like this. Now, this is, this is the extreme, so we're not going to see that. So what can we hope for the most? residual 
X or the IVs, we would hopefully oops, see something that looks like this. So let's make a note of what we observe. We observe that the mean of the residuals, hence of the errors, is zero. You can see that the symmetric balance symmetric above and below the below zero. Well, if that is the mean of zero, then the width of this band represents the variability or the variance standard deviation of the residuals, hence the error terms. And we can see that the constant as well. So that's another condition we want, is that the variance of the error terms is constant. By the way, I'm using the word error and residual interchangeably here, although there is a difference. But I won't need to explain it in this video. The variance of the error term is constant, and that condition is something we want. It's In the jargon, it's called homoscedastic. If the condition is not satisfied, that the error terms have different variance, we say that the error terms are heteroscedastic. Finally, we can use the residuals here to see if there's any outliers. Say I've got some observation way out here. This is far from the other lot. It's a possible outlier. So to recap, for a good model, the residual, the error terms should have a mean of zero. But this condition will be satisfied automatically if you include an intercept, i.e. a constant term, in your model. So that doesn't need to be checked for. It will just happen. Another thing is that we want our errors to be homoscedastic. I have constant variance. Another thing we want to look for is that we have no outliers. All right. There are a few other things, but these, this is what we can spot with the residuals. Apart from, but I shan't go into detail in this video, is the that the dots here should have ran, should be randomly scattered, right? But that is only the case if we are looking at something like time series, or the data can be ordered, have a natural ordering, such as in time series, or if we're dealing with distances. Lastly, to note that the residuals here that, that we're going to be looking at SPSS are not just plain old residuals, they're going to be standardized or studentized residuals for the reason I will explain once we start looking at the data. Right, we're fitting the model then. Regress earnings on school. Analyze regression linear. Take earnings to dependent box, schooling to the independent box. Go to plots. Now, what we want on the horizontal axis, what we call the x-axis, is the uh, d, uh, the uh, predict x or the predicted value of y. That's denoted by z pred. So that's the standardized, actually the standardized version of the y hat. And for the vertical axis, we're going to have. You can use either the z resid, which stands for the standardized version of the residual, not the plain old residual that I talked about, or we can use the studentized SR resid, uh, S resid. Okay, entirely up to you, it doesn't matter which one you use. Continue. Okay. Right, so here is the residual plot, and on the vertical axis we have standardized residual and on the horizontal axis we have standardized predicted value. So does it have a mean of zero? Is it balanced around zero? We said if we include the intercept it should be automatically. Well we can see in the residual statistics also a residual mean of residual is zero. So that's why I said we don't need to check for it really. Does it have constant variance? Is it balanced around is it a, now is it an even band around zero? Well, sometimes it's hard to tell from the picture, sometimes it's easy. Here you might say that, well, it seems to be fanning out as we're increasing predictive value, with increasing predictive value. So that would suggest this problem of heteroscedasticity. And how about this value here? That could be an outlier. It's far from the masses, isn't it? Now, in saying that, the scale is important. So notice that standardized residual, the minimum value here is minus 2 and it goes up to 4.
because when we standardize something, remember this is think about the z-score, we make it so that the variable has mean is normally distributed mean of zero and a variance of one. So that's why it's tightly bunched up on this band. We know that if it falls outside falls outside plus or minus two, if it's way outside there, then it's very untypical and it could be an outlier. Now this value here takes around value over four, so it's way above everything else in absolute terms. So it could be a, so for that reason it could be an outlier. How do we identify that case, that person? We could double click on the picture to bring up the chart editor. Then I click once and you'll see that yellow halo is appearing all the dots. Then we click on that dot that we want again. And now only that dot will have a halo and then we go to elements and we go show data labels case number given so it's case 15 and what does it mean to say case 15 it means that if we go back to the data set if we go here to case 15 this oops this the person with earnings of 19 say thousands of dollars years of schooling 12 is the outlier possible outlier Now, why is it important to use standardized as a, or studentized residual as opposed to the normal residuals is that the variance of the residuals, even when conditions of classical assumption are satisfied, can differ. And this therefore makes it hard to compare the residuals. By standardizing, we force all the residuals to have unit variance, and hence they're easier to compare. Just to see what the residual plot looks like if we use the normal residuals, let's go to Let's run the regression again. Analyze residual. Uh, sorry, linear regression. At this time, we go to save and we ask it to save unstandardized residuals. So, okay. Right, and now what we should have is a new column. Resid res. Okay, so let's build up the graph using chart editor, chart builder. Scatter plot, drag this into there. The resid, the unstandardized residual, the raw residual goes there. This time instead of using y hat, the predictive values, I'll just use the x value because remember I said it doesn't really matter which one you use. Okay, here it is. You can see the pattern is the same. Look at the axis though. Unstandard residuals, look at where it goes from minus 40 to plus 60. As opposed to what we'd seen before, minus 2 to plus 4. So just to say again, why we need standardized or studentized residual is that with the unstandardized residual, each of these residuals could have different variants. So we can't really, we can't, oof, can't really compare them. Sorry, my mouse is not mis my, my mouse is going running around. So we can't can't compare them. If we use unstandardized residuals, each of these residuals could have different variants. So we can't really compare them, even if it looks like this is far from the other ones. By standardizing them, I force them to have unit variance, and so and now I can make the comparison. So where have we got so far? I've shown you that with a residual plot, we can check to see that some of the assumptions of regression are satisfied, such as zero mean, but we don't have to check for that if we include an intercept, that we have the er errors are homoscedastic, and that there are no outliers. Some of you will be taught in courses that the errors should be independent as well. Now, that whether we can test for that really depends on the nature of your data. If you're doing something like a questionnaire, then that independence should be built into your data collection. So you would have used a probabilistic sampling method, such as simple random sampling 
or cluster sampling or stratified sampling something like that and then your your data your variables will be independent if you're doing something like something where your data is naturally ordered such as your data comes over time that's called time series or if it's some ordered by distance then we can run checks for what they call autocorrelation but that's that's uh, beyond this video tutorial right okay so residuals helpful to check some conditions visually but they are not formal tests so formal tests would should be run as well okay well that's to get you started then hope that's been helpful